And now, from the dark corners of the internet, where exploits run wild and packets aren't the only things getting sniffed, and the beer flows steady, it's Paul's Security Weekly. This segment is sponsored by Palo Alto Network's creators of the next generation firewalls, helping you enforce network security policies based on applications, users, and content. Visit them on the web at paloaltonetworks.com. And by the SANS Institute, the most trusted institute for the computer security training and stuff. (laughs) By the SANS Institute, the most trusted source for computer security training, certification, and research. Visit sans.org to learn more. It's now time to fire up a packet capture and pour yourself a frosty beverage and teach Larry how to speak, because (laughs) here's your host. It's a man who loves everyone at DerbyCon, especially when getting iced, (laughs) Paul Asadorian. Welcome, everyone, to Paul's security. uh, Is it which camera? Camera two? Camera three? Hi! Ah! Yes, hi. <laughs> uh, it's great to be here on the for episode 389 for Thursday, October 2nd, 2014. I've got a fantastic uh, cast and crew with me today. Very excited to have my good friend Larry Pesci sitting right next to me. Yay. And you have a very large antenna, Larry. I actually. do. No, that's so <laughs> it's skinny, but it's long. You say that so. all to all the girls, don't you? I do. Um it, we'll talk a little bit about DerbyCon. Speaking of DerbyCon, where we saw Mr. Joff Thayer recently. Welcome, um, Joff, to the show. <laughs> G'day, Paul. How are you? Oh, I good. had a really good time at DerbyCon. I especially liked getting to know my horsehead friends again. That's, you seem to have a thing for horsehead friends. I, I don't know what it is. They appear at DerbyCon, and <clears throat> we get hugs, and we get pictures. <laughs> We're going to send uh, horsehead. Carlos Perez was also at DerbyCon. We got to see Carlos live and in the flesh. Yay! Yep. And he's here on the show tonight as well. Carlos, welcome. Hey, Paul. Happy to be here. What's going on, dude? How lots, did your um? So how did your class go so at DerbyCon? You actually like worked where you were at DerbyCon. Yes, I spent a bit of time in the, in my hotel room working, and in addition to that, I did a two day class plus my presentation on Friday. That's awesome. <clears throat> and your class went well, I assume. Oh, super. That's good. Couldn't ask for better students. Uh, everybody was pumped. Everybody at the end was super happy. So I'm, I'm happy everything went well. Sweet. Uh, let's see. Is that that's all we have on the line, right? We're good. We're good there. Just a couple of quick announcements before we get into our interview. Don't forget the PVS contest from Tenable. Register the link in the show notes, and you can register to win an AR drone. You must use PVS to find something cool. Details again are on the registration page, which is linked to in the show notes. And I think the ten runners up get a uh, ten one hundred one thousand tap network nice. tap. Yeah, so that's pretty cool. <clears throat> Don't forget to register for Sands Las Vegas. I'll do it in order for Sands Las Vegas. Register. This is the order you're going to register for classes. And you're going to register for Larry's six seventeen wireless ethical hacking penetration testing and defense from October twentieth through the twenty fifth. Then you're also going to take. On October 26th through the 27th, the new course that I'm co-authoring with Ashley that I will be teaching called Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us. So if you're hearing that IoT thing and you're concerned about that, (coughs) which you should be, uh, you can register with a link in the show notes. Uh, Security Weekly listeners get a discount code SECWEEK10 for 10% off Embedded Device Security Assessments for the Rest of Us. I have also put a link in the show notes. So if you go to wiki dot securityweekly dot com or you click the wiki link off of our main page securityweekly dot com you'll see on the main page of those embedded systems resources if you click on embedded systems resources you get to a page in the first section there has an embedded video of my talk at DerbyCon the Internet of Insecure Things 10 Most Wanted list from also the links below that video you can get uh, registration from a SANS course SEC week 10 for 10 percent off you can get the slides from DerbyCon. You can read an article on the security of things that I posted to the se- uh, Tenable blog. You can also get a link to my interview on Risky Business, episode number 336, 
where I talk about the Internet of Insecure Things. So all that is there, wiki.securityweekly.com. Very nice. Yes. So, Paul, if I may add, every co-host on the show was actually a presenter at DobyCon, I believe. Uh, Jack's not here. I'm not sure that he presented. but Yes, he did. Everybody that's – oh, he did. Okay, yep. so everybody on the show presented, which is – Oh, I'm so, fabulous. May even so be a record. Because I'm the salad shooter, I just had a great idea. We should create a wiki page that's linked to off the main page. That's Security Weekly's presentations. And since we all have access to the wiki, anytime you do a presentation and want to put materials up, or for our listeners, for easy to find, you can put it there. That's Very good idea. idea. You feel free to do that. We, we can help you with that. We've got people that have access to the wiki. We even have Chris who's doing fabulous things with the wiki. Oh, heck yeah. If you go to our wiki, I'm not sure how far you've gotten since last time, Chris, but I know for sure that if you go to, is it tech segments or interviews or both? Okay. Yeah, that was for you, Chris. Tech segments. You can sort now tech segments by the episode name or the tech segment name or the episode number. And soon to be air date. And then we're going to do the same thing for interviews, the same thing for shows. We're going to do it all. We're going to do it all. We've got a great new way to organize content in our wiki. So that is a gigantic plug for wiki.securityweekly.com. It's kind of like our own personal notepad. <laughs> it <laughs> really, is. it is. <laughs> you know how many times I've actually gone. We, I've said it before. We'll I reference stuff in the wiki all the time. <laughs> yeah. So I'm like, I need to put something somewhere so that I have it yep. and can always access it. Like, look at my own tech segments. Look at tech segments mm-hmm. that you've done. There have been a couple of times where and I've Googled for something that I needed to do on a pen test. In our wiki, first comes up link first. Yeah. is the wiki. Yeah, which is cool. So it's a great resource. And I just patched that box for the shell shock vulnerability. So we're good. Sweet. We're good. We're talking about shell shock tonight, right? We are talking about shell shock at shell shock shell at shock. seven o'clock PM tonight. Woo. But before we get to that, we've got a fabulous interview with Don Murdoch. Don's a GSE and as an MBA and he's a leading information security professional with over thirteen years experience. He has experience in nonprofit academic and fortune five hundred settings. He's taught CISSP and intrusion analysis courses. With the Sands Institute, Don, welcome to the show. Hey, glad to be here, guys. Really looking forward to chatting with you guys tonight about the Blue Team Handbook. Yes, and most uh, recently, recently and yeah. notably, the Blue Team Handbook is a book that you are the sole author of, correct? That's right. Uh, what I've done, Paul, is I've taken tons of experience from real life, you know, things I've done on the job lessons I've taught other people, tidbits from a SANS class here and there, things I've gotten from other people. There's a guy you know named Larry. He had a few ideas, put some of them in there. And we've put this all together as a a condensed, no frills, zero fluff, carry it in your backpack or your back pocket incident response guide for the people on the blue team, the defender side of the BICs. Right, full full disclosure, I was uh, one of the technical editors on this book. So. Nice. So full disclosure. Yeah, that's actually true. And you know, Larry, you actually gave me some very sage advice and kept me out of a few footholds. <laughs> and uh, let me think. Uh, to to say it rightly, uh, some poop piles. How about that? Yes. I, I, well, you didn't get into. You got out of some of the poop piles, but there's one that I think I said, "Don't do it, man." <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I completely changed that whole section. It was like smoke and mirrors. It ripped out. You know, it was like a word thing. And I went into, you know, some other editing land, and we fixed that all up. Nice, nice. Yeah. Um, so, how did you get your start in information security, Don? Well, I was working at a at a company for a nonprofit, and I had a breakfast with a guy who told me about the CISSP, and I thought that's interesting. So I went down there, studied, took the test, and realized that I was 50 miles wide and one mile flat. <laughs> seriously you. honest to god i realized you know i may know great theory and I, I i learned a lot of the great theory and i got a chance to apply it but i had very very little practical hard skills so i searched and i searched and i searched and i found the mary washington program enrolled got a few sans classes under my belt and then a guy named roland harrison took a took a um took a chance on me and i went to work at odu as the information security officer where i got my combat training Gotcha. Cool. Uh, the combat training was a whole lot of fun. I have lots of stories. Actually, in the book, uh, the three examples of using Snort for responding to incidents, they're based on the practical experience that I got at ODU, uh, which is where a lot of the book actually came from. 
you know, yeah, I was doing gonna ask you what, packet what, capture analysis. Yeah, how did you from, get – so you picture. wrote a book on blue teaming. So, what, like, where did you gain all that experience? Well, I, I spent three years, three and a half years at ODU as the ISSO, and probably half of my job was dealing with some kind of a cybersecurity incident every single day. It was either – a website defacement, a botnet, a DMCA complaint, a piracy notice. Uh, we had some dealing with a student, you know, uh, people that are, you know, 18 years old, first coming into the university setting, and uh, had a number of botnets that we dealt with. I uh, had a, I think I've received eight subpoenas, three search warrants, and two other uh, engagements with various three letter agencies. I've actually had INS, excuse me, Immigration and Naturalization Service, fully armed to the teeth in my office to go get a guy. You know, it was a very exciting time. Very exciting time. Did they let you hold a gun and get a vest on and stuff? No, no but they did let me in one of the vehicles. Nice. And let me tell you what, we are spending some amazing amount of money on equipping our FBI with some amazing equipment. And that's probably all I should say. <laughs> <laughs> They just uh, I like shouldn't come, say any more than that. They I just, just might come I'm, get I'm really you happy they're on the stuff. job. Let's put it that way. Yeah, they, ju they just might come get you with some of that stuff. If you That's say right. That and, you know, they're, and we actually have a local office with 62 sworn down, uh, just down the road from me. And you know, one of them might be listening. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> I hear the NSA is listening to us. You know, maybe well, the Chinese. Well, yeah, that's, yeah. So, Dom, we talk a lot about pen testing and going on the offensive, right? And it's pretty easy to measure success there. Right, for the most part. Woohoo shells. Yes. Woohoo shell and what happens afterwards, right, is usually success. Success is something very difficult to measure on the blue team side. So what what do you consider success for this book? Oh, for the book itself or for the blue team practice? A little bit of both. Sure. So I can answer <laughs> the question on the book and that's a pretty cut and dry answer. I did a lot of research to try to figure out at what point would you consider a uh, book in the adult nonfiction category successful. And what I found is the average, uh, uh, in the, uh, it's the adult nonfiction category, computer books, technology books, you know, anything that you would consider a reference is in that category. And the average book in that category sells 5,000 copies in its lifetime. I've been very, very fortunate uh, six weeks into publication, and I think we've moved 1,650 copies. Uh, Go Sans DFIR list and advisory board and LinkedIn <laughs> postings and things like that. We've we're about a third of the way there in six weeks. I'm really ecstatic. That's Sweet. pretty good. Pretty good. Now let me answer your second question, Paul, because yeah. you asked me. Or we were talking. What do you consider success as a blue teamer? And the thing that I measure my personal success by in all the stuff I did at the college and in the corporate setting is: did we in fact? answer a question to management satisfactorily to know what the bad guy did. Now, I don't measure that, did the bad guy do something really bad? It was, could I actually tell the people that we're working for and whose networks we're defending, we, we, can, we can tell you what happened, what our risk was, what our data exposure is, and advise management on the actual, what we believe to be the measure of the impact. You know, and that's that's the the big thing that I have to say is doing this for a long time is giving that answer. Uh, I think one of the challenges that I've had in in this business is working with HR and legal, and you know they're they're after solving a problem right now. And the biggest thing I can tell you is that legal really loves it when you can say yes or no the data was exposed, and HR loves it when you can say yes or no the person didn't do it. They really hate that answer of. Well, the data kind of indicates this. And, you know, my, my approach to handling that has always been to lab up something and to say, you know, the, the case you're asking me about, this is what we think the person did. We labbed it up. Here's the proof. That's what the person did or that's what the person didn't do. So self-publishing, how was that experience for you, Don, and what drove you to self-publish? Um, well, first, I, I have to tell you that what I found over very closely monitoring Blue Team Handbook on Amazon is over the past seven weeks, the top one, two, and three books have all been self-published. Matter of fact, the only person who's kicked us off the list is a little guy you may have heard of called Kevin Mitnick. He's the only guy who's knocked me and Ben Clay and the other gentlemen out of the top three positions. So if you look at what's going on, I'm capable of writing a book, coming up with a cover, 
getting it physically published into a publishing print stream and advertised so I can reach a community without having to engage Addison Wesley or any of the other major publishing houses or Orbach or anybody like that. Now, it'd be really great if O'Reilly would pick me up, you know, a great company, really love their products. I mean, I really love their products. But today, with the community that we have and, and venues like this and people paying attention to leaders like you guys, it's a matter of building that one-on-one -on -one relationship. And I, I posted to a few places and a few right locations, and people bought it. And the one-on-one -on -one feedback I've gotten is pretty amazing, person-to-person. Uh, -person. And this people have put some very nice reviews on the Amazon site, which I'm sure helps. It does. A lot, yes. actually. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. So I, I don't need a publisher. Matter, matter of fact, over the process, I've had five people come to me and say, we want to get on the bandwagon. And I'm like, okay, you realize that there's a challenge here and we have, you have to do some certain things that an acquisitions editor at a major publishing house would have to do for you. And I can play that role for you. For instance, you have to find a technical editor who is as squared away as Larry was for me. That's a compliment, Larry. Thank you. I mean, you know, really. <laughs> and I had to go find, I, I didn't put this book together before I had seven people whose opinions I really trusted tell me that it was really valid. So for the next five publishers or authors we're working with, you know, that's what we have to do. Uh, I did some tech editing and worked with an acquisitions editor about 10 years ago. So I had a glimpse of what the publishing process was like. I was very fortunate uh, and worked on three or four projects. So that was what gave me a little bit of the confidence to go ahead and do this. Mm. And now, Don, you were uh, sort of a little bit inspired for the, the form factor, the self-publish, and sort of the direction of the content sort of out of the Red Team Field Manual, correct? Well, oh, now, yeah. Now, Don, the Red I mean, Team Field... I bought field... the RTFM, and I was totally impressed by what Ben Clay put together. Um, matter of fact, I think it'd be really cool if maybe Ben and I could come out with a one-year anniversary and stick them together and call it, like, the Purple Team Tome of Knowledge or something like that. <laughs> but it, if, the ever, if, if we ever do get together, I'll suggest the idea and see what he thinks because, you know, red plus blue makes purple. And, of course, you get black and blue in both sides of the process. Now, um, Don, his Red Team Field Manual is $9 is your, and yours is $12.27. Does that mean it's cheaper to be an attacker? <laughs> is that... Uh, I, I, I think that if you look at the word count and the content count, I'm about 25% above the red team in terms of page count and illustrations. And word count, um, I don't even know. You know uh, Ben's book is very much tables of very of really cool Command. focused information. Yep. And my stuff concentrates on some more explanation and some information to help you get there. Uh, and some, some background material that's really helpful to people. You know, I, for instance, I explain why you want to use a particular TCB dump command and w what exactly is suspicious ICMP traffic and why would you consider something to be suspicious for ICMP traffic versus normal ICMP traffic. Ben doesn't go into that in the red team book. He's just got, you know, hack and slash, you know, turn and burn commands that I could tell you I've actually used some of them and it's really good stuff, you know. Mm. No, that's, re that's really cool. Yeah, I like the idea of the purple, the purple team. Manual. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool? We we could mash them together and do like a one year anniversary or something like that. Because yeah, awesome. you know the difference between. <laughs> I'm afraid of red. This question. You know the difference between red and purple. No, right? please don't. The grip. I, I, the grip. It's a few <laughs> degrees on the color wheel. <laughs> the grip. <laughs> <laughs> the grip. Ah, good point. Yeah, I'm gonna grip my scotch while you guys think of your next question. <laughs> <laughs> Very good point. Do I have do I have to grip my scotch some more? You're going to ask me a really tough question. No. Uh, excellent, <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent. We're going to ask you really easy questions. Uh, we're going to ask you. Tell us about your most memorable incident response experience. Oh, it, it's really hard to tell you which one of the three, but I'll tell you the the lieutenant officer story. I don't want to give her name because she's still a sworn officer at the college. That's uh, probably close enough. So we had a guy. Uh, and we what all the have guy, a guy was doing on the campus was he was accessing an external site to do some identity theft. So we got notified by a, a major city law enforcement agency that they wanted our firewall trace data. Uh, and they wanted it over a, like a six-month date range, and they wanted very specific relationships. So my counterpart, uh, Adam, who worked for me, we actually devised a script to pull apart six months of firewall data package it up, show the pattern of activity, and then we put this all together with a letter and a CD-ROM, and we packaged it, and we sealed it, and then we FedExed it to the district attorney at the city, uh, the city attorney's office. 
Um, and she called me up and she said that she has never take, seen anyone taken that amount of care in producing evidence for a case, at which point I was very happy that I gave her that evidence with that strong chain of custody. So if she could get the guy, you couldn't bring our evidence into question. So a couple days later, the detective on the case, who I had actually met, believe it or not, at a Sands Intrusion Analysis class, <laughs> talk about small world, I met him at the, at the Atlanta event back in 2005, came down, he sat in my office, we walked through all the data with him, and they went to work with the university police department, and they got the guy, and they brought him into the interrogation room, and what they told me was, the guy didn't want to fold until they turned over the page of our evidence and pointed at it and said, we got you. And the guy just folds. He said it was just like TV. Once you showed him the evidence, the guy just completely folded and admitted and fessed up. And I assume he got several years in jail. But it was, that was really cool. That's the such other a great, one that was great really cool. To contribute it, like that. Yeah, it was neat. I yeah. mean, you know. Um, Mike Poor and I like to compete for law enforcement assists. Unfortunately, since you know I'm not in the academic space anymore, my law enforcement assists stop at about eight, and I think he keeps racking them up. Um, <laughs> you know that that's kind of the measure of the, of the man, right? How many law enforcement assists do you get? And I've I've got eight, and I'm happy with that. Um, <laughs> the other really cool case. This was a great island hopping case. It was total pivot. Guy whacks a bunch of machines through an exploit and takes those 20 machines and individually whack the next batch of 20 machines, then individually hack the next batch of the next 20 machines. And from the third group of 20 machines, he was actually doing a, a click jack process or, or an economic clicking process to a bunch of websites in Japan on a random basis. So what he'd do is he'd simulate a user clicking on a banner ad. So the short of it is that for about 14 days, this guy was generating false economic activity coming from his botnet under his control for a bunch of Japanese websites. And we found him because our IDS picked up something and the machines were offline. So we're like, okay, who else generated that alert? And then we had to go to the individual machine and look in the logs, the security logs, and see how he had created accounts and how he'd gone from one machine to the next and hacked and, and grabbed up the administrator password and done a pipe up admin type thing. And he, he island hopped and it was... It was really cool to take uh, all that SANS knowledge from all those courses I took earlier and actually apply it in the field. It was, it was really, really cool. And, of course, there wasn't very much I could do about it because it's a foreign country, but we stopped them. You know? And that very was cool. from a technical exploit moving through a network. It was pretty cool. Awesome. Um, <clears throat> so... You had sent in some questions, Don, and you had one here about what advice you can give us on talking with HR and legal in the corporate setting. And now, is this related to incident response or just oh, yeah. in general? Oh, okay, yeah. so incident, incident response. response yeah. yeah, yeah. What I what I found in talking to HR and legal over the years is, you know, a HR wants to make an assumption based on policy, right? And we as technical people really want to explain it to them. And what I've found is the best way to work with HR at, at three different organizations is to find that one person in HR that is a little computer savvy and build a relationship with that person. In my case, I actually found one. And all the cases that I worked with, I worked with her for four and a half years. And what I found is that by building up a relationship with that one person and spending the time with her, she then could translate to Technoblab no, techno speak, into HR language that helped them handle their cases. And I found that after about six months of this, we got really efficient. And she would come to me and she would say, Don, this is the nature of what we want to do and what we want to find. And I would say, okay, so let's look at the pattern of activity and get the, the date ranges and all that kind of stuff. And I could actually have a really substantive conversation. But it took training on my part as an incident responder and a lot of patience and that, that is an advice that I'd, I'd give anybody in the blue team world, in the incident response world, is find that one person in HR and spend time teaching them because that's going to pay off dividends in the long run. And the same thing is true with legal. Uh, for e-discovery, uh, legal really, they're extremely conservative people. I don't know how many conversations uh, you guys or people in the audience have had with lawyers, but we train them in law school to be conservative. 
because we train them to win and they don't like to take risks because risks mean they don't want, they might not win, right? We train them to win in simulated courts and all that kind of stuff. So what I found with legal is the same kind of thing, you know, what are the boundaries of the case and what is the exact specific question that you want to have answered and answer that question and then stop and pause and say, do you want more explanation? And you ask that question. And what you'll find is if they accept the idea of asking for more, they really want it. And then you have that avenue. But if, if you walk into an attorney, I mean, these are very brilliant people. I mean, they really are. They have juris doctorates. They've, they're very great thinkers. They're very strong thinkers. And when you talk to them privately, they'll say, yeah, I wanted to be an attorney once too. Why did I ever do this? <laughs> um, you know, they, they get down to that. We had a, a Commonwealth attorney at the university, and I tried very hard to explain to him why I wanted to push back on these DMCA complaints. And I, I totally failed in this area. And my friend Jeff was watching the conversation. He's like, Don's not relating to the attorney. I have to rescue him. And, and my buddy Jeff actually figured out what was going on because he took that step back. And ever since that day, I, I've really taken that approach of answering the question directly and then asking how much more they want because, you know, so long as you're honest and you answer that question, you can stand on it. So in the future, three years from now, you're going to get questioned. It works out really well. Larry, you had a question. Yeah, so Don, this is, uh, wasn't a question that necessarily we had in the, in the list, um, but I thought it was very appropriate. And um, it's based on something sort of very unusual that I've come to discover um, during the course of this podcast. Um, but uh, from a background perspective, yours has to be one of the most entering, interesting interviews we've ever conducted. Why? Veggie Tales. <laughs> That's the you That's like the that? Guy. You like that? Um, yeah. So what's, what's the deal with the Veggie Tales? Oh, my, when my wife and I first got married, we were over at a friend's house, and uh, we were watching this cartoon show, and we're like, oh, that's pretty cool. And in, in the one episode, the cucumber guy, he falls down in sand, and when he gets back up, you actually saw the nose print in the sand. Now, this was back in 1995. So in terms of computer animation, I was totally impressed with the fact that Big Idea did such a great job mimicking that. So we got some plush animals and we got some videos and we used them with our kids to teach them stories and moral lessons and good ethics and things like that. Uh, I use it in Sunday school. It's just it's something really, really fun. And it's very lighthearted. You know, you walk sure. into a, you know, somebody's dining room and you don't see somber paintings. You see upbeat, you know, veggie tales that are uh, uh, ready to go ahead and engage and have fun. This is a room where we play all our cards in the in the dining room here, so it's a, they're just fun background characters. Excellent. See, I, see, I would have expected that it was your office as opposed to the dining room, so that makes it that makes it even more special. Yeah, yeah. So that's that's very so cool. Next time you're in Norfolk, Larry, you're gonna have to come over. We're gonna have to feed you, and then we'll we'll, we'll play cards and drink scotch. I was gonna say that there's got to be cards and scotch and Veggie Tales involved. <laughs> oh, yeah. oh yeah. So Don, are there are there other ties to Veggie Tales? No, no. My wife and I both had plush animal sets. We used to go take pictures of uh, the Veggie Tales everywhere. Um, she's got pictures of Veggie Tales in a cave. My wife actually is an avid caver. She'll spend three days underground. So she's taken Larry the cucumber down to the to the depths of Oregon Cave and taking pictures of him down there. It's just it's just a fun thing to do. You know, it's a bit of a hobby. Wow, I like Larry, Larry, I like the, Larry the cucumber. <laughs> it's not the first time I've heard that before. <laughs> I was Sorry, waiting Don. for Sorry, that. Don. Had to. Are we talking about Larry's cucumber? Yeah. <laughs> no, Larry the cucumber. Larry the oh, cucumber. Oh, yeah. I, I, I miss, I misheard that. Which is a really bad thing when it falls down in the sand, because then you know exactly, it's very bad because yes. it leaves lumps. Yes. You also get sand. Yeah, is that right. what happens when you tie your shoelaces? <laughs> well, you know, I, I live at a beach and I haven't been to the ocean for like 15 years since I've been married. That should tell you something. Wow. Wow. Uh -uh. Uh, don't go! Don't don't go there anymore. <laughs> so, Don, uh, doing incident response, you must have some inevitable experience with the sim guys. Which, oh yeah. What's your oh, yeah. thought on the the state of sim? So, I think that sim is really good at taking lots of data and getting you part way there. Sim is not really good because we don't implement it implement it as well as we should. About actually telling you the real risk that you experience. So in the corporate setting, and we were the first university in the Commonwealth of Virginia to actually deploy a SIM. Uh, ODU was. We deployed a guarded net before they got swallowed up by IBM. Uh, and what we found is the SIM stuff is great at taking a bunch of data from a bunch of sources and normalizing it and telling you 
this does in fact relate to this. I had a case one day where uh, a person visited a website and then the antivirus immediately kicked off. So I'm monitoring the console and I see website block for username, 80, 87 uh, virus messages for the same username. And I was like, okay, put two and two together. I call her up. The poor woman is in tears because she was reading soccer mail. And I said, is soccer mom mail or soccer mail? <laughs> well, <laughs> you know, but but so the SIM really does good up to that point, but SIM doesn't do really well at Connecting the dots for you. There's no such thing as a SANS trains analyst in a box. I mean, you know, SIM is never going to replace somebody that's been to an intrusion analysis and a security incident response class and a pen testing class, you know, that kind of education. It just can't. Because I have to understand my environment. I have to understand what business processes are enabled on a machine. And unless I take a lot of time and I build an asset model that's ever changing and always trying to play catch up or mustard or mayonnaise, the SIM will never do that. So you really have to have that tribal knowledge of your environment to make good use of, of, of where the sim stops. Does that answer your question? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Certainly. I could probably go on, you know. Um, so what, what can the sim guys do better? I think that the, the number one thing the sim guys can do better is to make it really easy to get asset and application data into the product because if we had better ways of getting asset intelligence and the business value of the asset itself and incorporate that into a risk score you'd have a better way of, of elevating a, a, a thing that the sim finds or de-elevating things that are not normal here's uh, an example a lot of sim vendors do that already though yeah but you know the, the question is how do how do they make it painless for the organization to implement it, because what, well, what I've found I, I can't, is I've that, never implemented an enterprise sim, so I can't speak to that. But yeah, that's, a, I, that's the, like the most popular and, feature and request for any kind of event or vulnerability or, or threat management system. Right? Is you want to have a formula where you describe how what assets they are, what characteristics of those assets are most critical, and lead that into a risk score. And that's typically what management wants to see. I don't care about the 8 million vulnerabilities we have in our network. I just want to know is what's most important to us being addressed. Exactly. That, that, that's exactly the point. And um, in, in mid-sized companies, all the folks I've talked to, management, bless their hearts, they don't staff the sim people very well. It's, yeah, we'll spend a million bucks on the product, but we're not going to give you the two people that it takes to put all that intelligence mm -hmm. into the sim and tune it. It's, it's not a... I was fortunate I was the single guy running it, and I could only make so much progress because the next incident would happen. So to do sim really well, you definitely have to have the staff involved to feed it, and you have to have a process to provide continued care and feeding uh, to your sim platform. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, otherwise yeah. it just becomes one big data collection store. Right, and and that in and of itself is valuable if you yes, have the tribal knowledge in your head. Like mm -hmm. I could look at events all day long and say, I don't care about that, even though you tell me it's right. I don't care about that. But that one where this guy went to a blocked site in Paraguay at 2.30 in the morning, that's valuable. And right. it turns out the guy's machine was whacked. So, excuse me, hacked. I'm sorry. Either way. Exactly. Either, Either way. way. Yeah, Either way, I, it was bad and he got re-imaged. Yeah, and I, and I think you, you sort of touched on one thing that was really big there, Don, is that, that sort of institutional slash visceral knowledge of what's bad and what's good that right. comes from – doing this over time yeah i mean you you can't replace the fact that i'd worked in my environment for seven years and i'd read change control and implemented applications and and knew that these sets of servers are used for this purpose and you know no matter how great the technology is it's it's really very difficult to take that that tribal knowledge and impart it into the product so don what's next for the blue team field manual well, we've got a series of uh, virtual book tours uh, that are going to start in two or three weeks. Pay attention to the website. We're going to advertise them out there on blueteamhandbook.com. And I have five people who are, who are signed up to do some co-authorship. Uh, I've got uh, Jill Wheeler and her, her husband, Dave, uh, creators of IPsec. They're going to do something on vulnerability application management. Um, I've got a guy from a European nation state who wants to remain nameless until he actually has his outline. Uh, he's worked for a CERT team for one of the European countries. 
And I've got another buddy of mine who's a sim expert. The, the next book for me is going to be, we're going to call it Simplementations. And it's taking that, you know, combined we have 20 years of experience with nine different sim products. And we want to take that knowledge and do the same thing we did for Blue Team uh, Incident Response. And we want to take it down in, you know, Blue Team Sim Implementations and take the idea of hooking up WebSense plus antivirus plus firewall denies means X, Y, Z. And how do you take the, the data points and turn it into something actionable. And the other thing in the implementations book is going to be how do you take the SIM and actually support your IT general controls program? Because that's what auditors and management want. They want to show good IT general controls. So a virtual book tour, uh, four or five more authors. I've got a, somebody going to do a, a blue team handbook on memory forensics. I'm really excited about that one, like you wouldn't believe. Uh, the next one for me is going to be a NICS-based incident response edition. It'll probably grow to 300 pages. And once that's done, I'm going to do the system forensics uh, book all on exploring Windows and Linux and looking in the disk drives and finding fun stuff and uh, how, you know all the various things you can find out from what the evil guy did. Don, are you ready to play five questions with Paul.com? Yes, and oh, I, and I thought I about one of that? the answers too. You did. You owe me $5. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, you know, oh, John, $5. I do. And a beer, apparently. Sorry. I really played five questions with Security Weekly. Can we edit that out? No. <laughs> I'm taking the beer. I'm just going to tell you right now. I owe everyone a beer. <clears throat> I'm, I'm grabbing the scotch. Yeah, there you go. Have <laughs> some more scotch. on. Uh, well, that actually came from a listener. We're drinking some Oban 16-year listener. So, Don, <clears throat> we're going to play five questions. Ready? Okay, good. Three <laughs> words to describe yourself. Paramedic on a mission. If you were a serial killer, what would be your weapon of choice? A cold hard stare or an HKUSP. If you wrote a book about yourself, what would the title be? Singer, songwriter, and stupid. In the popular game of Ask Grabby Grabby, do you prefer to go first or second? Second, because that's the blue team way of responding to an incident. There you go. Pick two celebrities to be your parents. You know, I thought about this one, and I'm really partial to Jennifer Garner. And I'd have to say for the dad, it would be Harrison Ford, but you'd got to mix a little bit more Arnold Schwarzenegger in there. Yeah. A little uh, bit. Harrison's got the looks, but Arnold's got the kick butt. Excellent. A little volatile mix in there. Huh? Yeah, yeah, you know. I don't know. That's not two. I think that might be cheating. <laughs> That's why I say a little bit of mixing. Kind of like, you well, know, when you have your scotch, you got to put a little bit of warm water in it. You know? It was a, yeah, it was, a, it was a sperm bank, and they could somehow... <laughs> Intermingle the DNA, <laughs> but only one wins. Like, a, would that hey, be? A, hey, Paul, we don't want to hear about your kids, man. Is that Come a on. cocktail? Would they? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, and on that note, yeah. Don, thank you very much for appearing on Security Weekly. We're thank you guys. It's been great. <laughs> thank you. Oh, We're hey, take... uh, one last thing. There will be an author sighting. I will be at Sands, Virginia Beach, and I will have my silver pen if you come find me. Nice. For those of you who have a copy and want an autograph. Excellent. With that, we're going to take a short break, come back, and do our interview on SCADA CTF. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Yeah. 